Thank you for coming. This is nice to see such a good crowd here tonight. Thank you. Um, welcome. And the first thing I'd want to say is we um, have a um, want to say thanks to the Portland Public Library for partnering with us tonight. Um, and they were able to help set up everything, and we very much appreciate it. So my name is Peg Bellano. I'm the co-president of the Portland Area, excuse me, League of Women Voters. <laughs> And I'm here to introduce tonight Ann Luther for a presentation on the struggle for women's suffrage. <clears throat> so Ann currently serves as treasurer of the League of Women Voters of Maine and chairs the League of Women Voters Advocacy Committee. I don't know how many of you have seen her Under the Dome newsletter that she sends out every week when the legislature is in session. She served as president of the League from 2003 to 2007, and as co-president from 2007 to 2009. In her work for the League, Anne has worked for greater public understanding of public policy issues and for the League's priorities issues in clean elections, campaign finance reform, voting rights, ethics in government, ranked choice voting, and repeal of term limits. Representing the League at Maine Citizens for Clean Elections, she served that coalition as co-president from 2006 to 2011. She remains on the board of MCCE and serves as treasurer and chair of the program committee. Would you please welcome Ann Luther. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me well enough? OK, good. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm uh, really looking forward to giving this talk tonight, and thank you to the library and the Portland Area League for hosting this event. It's uh, such a timely topic. It's not only the anniversary of the 19th Amendment, next year will also be the 100th birthday of the League of Women Voters and the League of Women Voters of Maine, and it's really a moment to celebrate our history and reflect on our past and our future, so that's what we're here for tonight. Thank you all for coming to listen. Um, let me find the page down button here. How's that working? Okay, so the 19th Amendment um, is what we're here for. As I said, next year marks the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. Women suffragists in the United States engaged in a sustained, difficult, multi-generational struggle. It was 72 years between the Seneca Falls Convention and the passage of the 19th Amendment. Many of the founders of the movement did not live to see the accomplishment of their vision. It was one of the largest civil rights movements in history. It was huge. At the same time, um, we have some other things to reflect upon tonight. So we want, first of all, to talk about how the 19th was won. But there were splits and divisions in the movement, as there are in every reform movement. We can see that in our own work today. There were many who got left behind, um, not only women, but other people who did not get the vote when the 19th Amendment passed. So there was a lot of work left undone. We want to talk about the arc of justice and whether it does bend, or I guess it's the arc of the moral universe bending towards justice. But we're going to talk about that a little bit and the work that lies ahead as we move into our second 200 years. We want to rededicate ourselves to that work left undone, not only for women in politics, but also for so many others who face systemic barriers to full political equity and voter participation. Issues of citizenship, equity, race, gender, immigration status, voting rights, have been debated since the founding of the Republic. Slavery was the elephant in the room from the very beginning. Who's a citizen? What counts as citizens? How do you qualify as a citizen? Who gets to vote? These issues were all on the table from day one, and they remain debated even to this day. The same themes that resonated through the founding of our Republic also echoed in the fight for women's suffrage, and we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. In 1776, Abigail Adams famously wrote to her husband, John Adams, asking him to remember the ladies in the founding of the nation. Adams replied, the men will fight the despotism of the petticoat. I mean, it sounds a little funny, right? But I don't think he was entirely kidding. 
uh, that women's suffrage was a radical idea in the 18th and 19th century. At this time, women held subordinate positions. They had many duties, many responsibilities, few rights. Some of the rights enjoyed by women were withdrawn when they married, and uh, for this reason, many suffragists in the 19th century remained unmarried to preserve those rights. Abigail Adams' plea to her husband fell on deaf ears. Some early colonial women were able to vote if they paid taxes, if they owned property, functioned as an unmarried head of household. In New York, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and New Jersey, for example, some women were allowed to vote. However, by the time we get to the 1787 U.S. Constitutional Convention, voting qualifications were in the hands of the states, and we know why. This was a states' rights issue, right? But women in all the states, except New Jersey, had lost the right to vote by 1787. And a few years later, um, they lost that right in New Jersey as well. This painting depicts the trial of Red Jacket. Red Jacket was a famous Iroquois chief, very charismatic fellow. You know, he had a very checkered, up and down sort of career. But the trial, um, he was being tried here uh, for witchcraft. This painting is notable because it shows women participating in the trial of Red Jacket. They served on juries, they had a vote. Many of the ideas about individual rights that were adopted by the founders um, had been absorbed and admixed with European Enlightenment ideas um, by people living in close proximity, particularly to the Iroquois nations, but to Native Americans. And the utterly unique formulation of Republican democracy that arose in the early days of the American colonies was a result of that very unusual circumstance. Early feminists, too, were inspired by the example of women in the Iroquois Confederacy. Women participated in all the major decision-making. Women had the power to veto an act of war. They had the power to nominate a chief. They had a power to remove the chief for whatever reason. Um, they had property rights. They had voting rights. They had political, oops, sorry, a little too fast there. Hold on, my notes are down here a little bit further. Um, they had uh, property rights, voting rights. They had political power. They served on juries. Early suffragists, particularly Lucretia Mott and Matilda Gage, saw this firsthand and took that idea into their own thinking about the place of women in white America. The other factor that sort of catalyzed some of the women's suffrage activity was um, chattel slavery, abolition. The Grimke sisters pictured here um, were early um, daughters of a South Carolina slave-holding family. They had hated slavery from childhood. They began speaking to groups of women at first, later joined by more and more men in the audience. Quakers, church sewing circles, female anti-slavery societies were all places where women could get together and work on politics, particularly motivated by their, hate, their hatred of slavery. But this was not generally thought an appropriate outlet for women's energies. Here's a cartoon that says, uh, a downright garbler or a goose that deserved to be hissed. So women taking advantage of the opportunity, well, that's not really the right word, but women working in, in the slavery movement, in the abolition movement, were disrespected, um, There was bias shown to them. They were not allowed to play an equal role. And so the role that the Grimke sisters were playing was strongly opposed by the Council of Congregational Ministers in Massachusetts as unwomanly and unchristian. They suffered discrimination in that work. Their activism for abolition, because of their outrage at that discrimination, founded the linkage between abolition and women's rights, and they weren't the only ones. Many of the abolitionists who became active in the greater um, cause for universal voting rights and women's rights, including the Grimke sisters, Lucy Stone, Lucretia Mott, Susan Anthony, Sojourner Truth, many, many others, and even Fre some men like Fre Frederick Douglass started out in the abolition movement and um, ramped up their efforts for universal suffrage as a, using that as a base. 
The seeds for the suffrage movement were actually planted in the summer of 1840, and this is a discrimination story. Uh, many women uh, joined an American delegation to the World Anti-Slavery Convention in London. Despite protests, women in the delegation were not seated among the delegate participants. They were seated in the balcony, and they were outraged, sitting passively among the spectators. Among them were Lucretia Mott. She was a Quaker, part of the Underground Railroad, and also there was the young wife of an abolitionist leader, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Her father had been a judge, and from child, childhood, she had heard his often reiterated advice to the women who sought his help that they had no legal rights. She had that as a basis, and now this discrimination on top of it. The two women became fast friends, and with the help of other Quakers, they called a convention in 1848 to discuss the social, civil, and religious rights of women. They published an announcement in the Seneca Falls Country Courier, setting a date for the following week, like one week's notice, and inviting the public to come. 300 people showed up, including 40 men, most notably here again, Frederick Douglass, a former slave and the country's most prominent black abolitionist. Elizabeth Cady Stanton opened the meeting by reading the Declaration of Sentiments, which was an adaptation of the Declaration of Independence to fit women's issues. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal and so forth that went on. Stanton listed many grievances, lack of access to education, employment, independent political voice, and her call for a right to vote for women was considered radical at that time and was not unanimously approved on the floor of the convention. In fact, Frederick Douglass saved that proposal as part of the final resolution that passed, making a very impassioned speech on behalf of women's right to vote. And in the end, after two days, 68 women and 32 men signed their names to the Declaration of Principles and the movement was launched. Susan B. Anthony was an incomparable organizer. Having joined the movement in 1851 after meeting Stanton, her father, also a staunch abolitionist, she knew Frederick Douglass and other anti-slavery leaders. The working association and the friendship between Stanton and Anthony was legendary. Their talents and circumstances in life were complementary. Stanton was married with a big family. Um, Anthony was single and able to uh, adopt a flexible uh, lifestyle. Sometimes she would babysit for Stanton's children while Stanton was off doing other things. She could travel when Stanton was stuck home. The two of them well, and a, other, a host of other national leaders um, were behind this movement. These are only the two most famous. Um, here are a couple others. Sojourner Truth was a freed slave who became an active aboli abolitionist. And in 1851, Women's Rights Convention in, a in Akron, Ohio, she came forward as a woman speaker was being heckled from the stage. And she, the speaker, yielded her dais to Sojourner Truth, who made this electrifying speech, Ain't I a Woman, a very famous speech that actually turned the tide of the moment um, in favor of women's suffrage. At the same time, many of the white leaders of the suffrage movement were more comfortable with Sojourner Truth, who was an uneducated black woman from a slave background, than they were with someone, someone like Mary Church Turrell, who was the first black woman to receive a college education. She was very well-spoken, very articulate. She was not adopted in the same way by the white leadership of the suffrage movement. Lucy Stone came from a, a poor farming family. She worked hard, saved money, went to Oberlin, Oberlin was the first college to offer co-ed degrees beginning in the 1830s. She lectured on women's rights and on slavery. She married Henry Blackwell, a staunch abolitionist and advocate for women's rights. Together, between the two of them and their daughter, Alice Stone Blackwell, they were active in the movement from the beginning, from 1847 right on through to 1920. There were many others. Lucretia Mott, Ernestine Rose, Abby Kelly Foster, Paulina Wright Davis, Frances Harper, Harper, Charlotte Fortin Grimke, um, white women, black women, Jewish women, all active, so many stories, so little time. 
tens of thousands of women took part in the struggle, and we're not going to be able to tell all their stories tonight. But state leaders and black women who underlined the link between the freedom of the slave and equality for women of any color, this was a really strong theme in the movement right up through to the Civil War. Another place where women were organizing and finding their own voice was in the labor movement. Organized labor, along with abolition, was a key early constituency for women's rights. During the first half of the 19th century, women worked in more than 100 in industrial occupations. They earned mostly very low wages. They lived in slum conditions, um, and they were the first to organize for better pay and shorter hours. Sarah Bagley, the first notable woman trade unionist in the U.S., organized the Lowell Female Labor Reform Association. Women went out on strike in the 30s and 40s, and they were strongly opposed by men. But the tactics that women used in organizing for labor rubbed off on women organizing for voter rights. These were early allies. The women's rights movement ground to a complete halt when the Civil War started. Neither Mrs. Stanton nor Ms. Anthony accepted this very gracefully, but there was nothing else to be done. It was a consuming moment in our history. Many abolitionists mistrusted Lincoln, but they worked hard to support him as long as he was waging war for freedom. Um, they worked hard to, for and collected 400,000 signatures to petition Congress to pass the 13th Amendment. And here we come to the Reconstruction Amendments. The 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution ratified in 1865 in the aftermath of the Civil War abolished slavery in the United States. The idea that women deserve the same rights as men had been growing steadily in the United States, in the United States since the 1840s. Many people, including the ruling Republican Party, supported both the abolition of slavery and women's rights before the Civil War. But after the Civil War, Republic and the sacrifice that that had, to the toll that that had taken on the country. After the Civil War, Republicans felt they had to do everything they could to make sure freed slaves got the right to vote and were able to keep it. Republicans put women's rights on the back burner. They didn't think they could get both, and they thought they had to choose blacks over women. Some women in the party were furious about this and felt betrayed by the party, but there, there it was. The 14th Amendment, um, passed in 1870, defined U.S. citizenship. Section 2 introdu introduced the word male for the first time into the Constitution and guaranteed voting rights for men only. Women's rights leaders who had put away their cause during the Civil War believed that when peace came, their sacrifice would be rewarded. They were disappointed. The Republican Party had their eye on two million potential black voters in the South Abolitionists believed this was the hour of the Negro, and with justification, the circumstances for slaves was appalling, inhumane, and devastatingly cruel. But neither Republicans nor abolitionists had any attention of allowing anything to interfere with Reconstruction for blacks, and the vote for women um, got sidelined. Six months later, the 15th Amendment was introduced. The right of citizens shall not be denied or abridged by a lot of other things, but not sex. Nothing said about sex. These amendments effectively decoupled citizenship and voting. Every citizen was not guaranteed the right to vote. Stanton, Stanton and Anthony were indignant. The combination of these amendments made clear to them that yet another amendment was now going to be needed to guarantee the right for women. Other women, Lucy Stone, Julia Ward Howe, some others disagreed. They, they thought passage of these amendments say, was good, saying that they were glad anybody could get out of this morass, and they were happy if blacks were able to do it, get out of this terrible pit. But in, and in some fairness, Stanton and Anthony thought keeping them together, voting rights for blacks and for women, would help them both pass at the same time. That optimism proved unfounded. Um, some women, led by Stanton and Anthony, worked hard to secure peti petitions against the Reconstruction Amendments. Um, nevertheless, the amendment passed in 1870. The thing was, though, that by the time that passed, um, let me get out of here. 
three down. Yep, just this one. Dreams of uni universal suffrage were dashed. Um, it was a kind of Sophie's choice, and one was sacrificed, and the rift that opened up between um, blacks and women never really healed after that. The echoes of this rift would reverberate for generations, still reverberates today. There was also a rift in the women's movement after this. In, uh, the actual split took place in 1869 when a convention of the Equal Rights Association broke apart on the issue of women's suffrage to the Constitution. We just talked about that. Both sides believed that women should have the right to vote, but they clashed sharply on how. These, these rifts in the movement were almost always about tactics. Mrs. Stanton and Ms. Anthony organized the more radical National Women's Suffrage Association for women only. They believed that other matters of women's rights, equal pay, um, child welfare laws, you know, all these other women's uh, rights issues should also be part of the broader movement. Lucy Stone, Henry Blackwell, Julia Ward Howe, or, and more conservative activists formed the American Women's Suffrage Association. They believe that work should be done not at the federal level but in individual states and they believe that we shouldn't work on these other issues. If it didn't have to do with voting, let's just stick to voting. Um, and so the two went along their separate paths. But at the same time, women were covering all bases. This doesn't have anything to do with voting, but women were playing baseball at this time. Um, they were all over the country. Women began to take an active role in political actions to bring about women's suffrage, and they were doing it all. They were organizing state suffrage associations and informing public opinion, giving lectures and talks. They were conducting campaigns in several states for suffrage referenda. They were maintaining pressure on Congress at the federal level for an amendment to the Constitution. And they were engaging in acts of civil di disobedience. Women tried to vote in 1871 and 1872 using separate ballot boxes. It didn't work, but they were out there trying. Like reformers today, suffragists did not ignore the opportunity for judicial relief. There were a couple of court, court cases. Susan Anthony led a group of 16 women in Rochester, New York, to register to vote in presidential election in 1872. Prosecutors and the Grant administration were anxious that the case not go to the Supreme Court, and a compliant local judge made it so by denying her grounds for appeal. At the same time, in 1872, Virginia Minor tried to register vote and refused, was refused by the registrar in St. Louis. She and her husband, the Miners, sued in St. Louis Circuit Court. The Minor case did go to the Supreme Court, which then handed down a decision in 1874 that suffrage was not coextensive with citizenship and that states were within their rights to withhold suffrage from women. Devastating. The first amendment for federal women's suffrage was introduced in Cong Congress in 1878, but the one that we've come to know and love was first introduced in Congress in 1878. This was called the Anthony Amendment. When it finally passed as the 19th Amendment, it was this exact wording, but this was first introduced in Congress in 1878. It originally, it was to be the 16th Amendment, but it failed to pass, and subsequently 16, 17, and 18 were taken up by other measures. 16 was the income tax, 17 was the direct election of senators, 18 was prohibition. The, eight, the 1878 Anthony Amendment passed more than 40 years later without a single change in wording, but in 1878 it didn't have a prayer. It was roundly defeated, led almost entirely by the southern states. In 1869, the territory of Wyoming became the first, not a state exactly, territory to offer women's suffrage. Um, they had a bill. It gave women the vote, control over their property, protected them against wage discrimination as teachers. It was introduced by Democratic lawmakers because they thought the Republican governor wouldn't pass it. It was to embarrass the Republican governor. I don't think they really thought it was going to go. And also it was Wyoming, it was nine to one, men to women, and they thought they would put something up that might get a few women to move to, my own, to Wyoming. 
So they got, they got this thing through. But there was a little bit of a racial undertone there too. You know, some of the sponsors thought, well, shoot, if African American men can vote and if Chinese men can vote, then well, darn it, white women ought to be able to vote and we'll put this thing forward. So their motivations weren't entirely altruistic and I think they were a little surprised when it passed and then the Republican governor did sign it. In the first election after that, about 1,000 women did go to the polls and many of them voted for Republicans, even though it was the Democrats who put this measure forward. Um, in 1893, Colorado was the first actual state um, to bring the uh, right to vote to their women citizens, and then a bunch of states that started to follow. Um, Utah introduced, well, 1896 was Idaho, and then Utah introduced something quite early, and it got snaggletoothed up with, um, uh, thank you, what's the word, polygamy. And so n you, nobody got anything until much later when Utah actually became a state and they did pass the right to vote for women in Utah finally. Um, it took until I think 1910, or Washington, no, Washington passed it in 1883, the state of Washington, but the liquor lobby got it repealed. We're gonna talk a little bit about the liquor lobby throughout tonight, but most people thought if women got the right to vote, they were going to enact prohibition because they were, women were the victims of drunken, disorderly husbands, and they thought the solution to that was to get rid of the liquor. And so the liquor lobby wasn't for women getting the vote because they thought it was going to hurt liquor sales. Um, so anyway, Washington did pass it, but the liquor lobby got it overturned, and it took until finally 1910 to um, put it back in Washington. But by, by 1910, there were a few states that had it. It was kind of a long dry spill between 1895 and 1910, but now we've got four states. And then all of a sudden, the dam burst. Between 1911 and 1914, a bunch of states passed it, California being the biggest one. In that statewide campaign, tons of money, lots of activists, a huge on-the-ground campaign. They outsmarted the liquor lobby by working only in the rural communities. The liquor lobby got San Francisco and Los Angeles, but the women's rights activists worked out of town, and in, in, the, in the end, they prevailed by a very, very narrow margin and won um, the right to vote using r rural women to pass the measure. Suddenly, women had the vote in six states with a total of 37 electoral votes for the presidency, and they were becoming a political force. Other Western states soon followed. This map shows the state of play in 1914. Women were voting in federal elections in all those Western states. Um, in some of these stripy states, they were able to vote not in federal elections, but in local and school board elections. Um, Illinois had a weird sort of hybrid. Uh, they could vote in municipal and presidential elections, partially in state and uh, county suffrage. But there were a bunch of states, and you can sort of see a little bit of a southern tilt here that had not capitulated at all. And of course, alas, we see Maine on that list. No suffrage for Maine in 1914. Meanwhile, in the campaign, you know, the women's rights organizations, Alice Stone Blackwell, again, the gifted daughter of Lucy Stone and Henry Blackwell, engineered um, a heel between the breach between the American and the National Associations, and they held a joint convention in 1890. During these working years, um, activists gained confidence, they ran campaigns, they developed skills, they mobilized resources, they learned how to maneuver through the political process, and they built a social movement. Um, other things were going on in society that contributed to the building momentum. The expansion of women's opportunities for higher education provided a catalyst for suffrage action. Many of the women after graduation found themselves excluded from the professions and began working in social justice issues where they quickly found that as much as they did good work, they couldn't really make change unless they had political power in the vote. At the same time, lips that touch liquor shall not touch mine. Uh, many women became interested in suffrage through their membership and other activities, including the um, Women's Christian Temperance Union. In 1874, the Women's Christian Temperance Union 
had chapters in every single state in the nation and represented 200,000 women. They were an early supporter of women's voting rights, especially because of the alcohol thing, as I mentioned before. Many suffrage leaders worried about the linkage between these two issues, though, and many blamed the liquor industry for having thwarted the passage of state referendums in many, many states. So this was a fraught partnership between temperance and, um, and suffrage. The National Association of Colored Women, formed in 1896, was an early and important endorser of women's suffrage. Voting rights were maybe more important to black women even than they were to white women. But these two voting rights for blacks and for whites had been linked back from the beginning. Nevertheless, black women were not accorded equal equity in the suffrage movement. These chapters were not welcome in the other national organizations and they were often, I hate to say segregated, but set off to the side. The General Federation of Women's Clubs, there's still a very active women's club up in Hancock County, um, was established in 1890. It represented at first 200 groups, 20,000 women. They had often been initiated in communities for education and, and cultural purposes, but oftentimes their conversation would slop over into child welfare, temperance, poverty, public health, and in those venues, when they became interested in reform, they soon realized that they couldn't really get anything done unless they had the vote. The, um, the Federation of Women's Clubs did not officially endorse suffrage until 1914. And you can see, just by looking at these pictures, I mean, these are more affluent women, maybe a little bit more conservative. And because their membership was diverse, and large, it was very difficult for them to achieve consensus on whether to endorse this movement or not. But when they did, finally, in 1914, it was huge. By that time, the Federation had over 2 million women members throughout the U.S., and that endorsement was really a big step forward. A lot of diversity here. Since the beginning of the women's rights movement, women who devoted their lives to reform were often upper and middle class, middle up and upper middle class women. Women who worked to support themselves and their families didn't have time for this sort of thing. But in the late 19th and early, early 20th century, working women began supporting suffrage in greater numbers. This is the um, women's suffrage garden plot. Vote for women's suffrage amendment, November 6th, 1917. Um, they joined labor unions, they held strikes for higher pay, protested for better working conditions. Harriet Stanton Blatch was Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter, and she was the first one to really reach out to labor unions and try to bring them into the suffrage movement. They um, had a different kind of tactic. You know, these labor organizers were more aggressive, they were a little bit more militant, they were a little bit more in the streets. You know, it was not so much an under the dome strategy as it was an in your face strategy with speakers on street corners, big noisy parades. And that addition of this labor union culture into the mix of the suffrage movement brought a little bit of new energy and we'll hear more about that later. In 1912, women's suffrage was supported for the first time at the national level by a major political party. That was Theodore Roosevelt's Bull Moose Party. Interest in the federal amendment, though, was at an all-time low. And then here comes Alice Paul with some of her labor ideas about um, how to really run a movement. She was a brilliant organizer. She really shook things up. She was an inspiring leader. She had a cadre of radical young women with her. and. Um, they chafed at the conservative leadership of the National Association, the Na National American Women's Suffrage Association, but they borrowed strategies from labor and from their more radical colleagues in England, and within two months of their arrival in Washington, they had organized a huge parade, a massive suffrage parade held on March 3rd, the day before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. The parade called for a constitutional amendment to the federal constitution, 8,000 marchers, state delegations from all over the country, 
nine marching bands, four mounted brigades, 20 floats, and an allegorical performance near the Treasury Building. It was a huge to-do. The parade began late, but it seemed to sort of be getting off to a pretty good start. Um, but then it got choked up by the tens of thousands of spectators who were there for the inauguration. These were mostly men. The marches, marches were jostled. They were ridiculed by the crowd. Some were tripped. Others were assaulted. The policemen appeared either indifferent or to side with the men. And um, before the day, 100 marches had been hospitalized. The mistreatment of the marchers amplified the event. It got even more publicity than they had hoped for and turned into a major s news story uh, leading to congressional hearings where the superintendent of police in Washington, D.C. actually lost his job. I think Alice Paul could not have been more pleased. I'm sure she did not wish for anybody to get hurt, but the ensuing publicity was a huge boost for the movement. This, of course, catalyzed another rift. You know, it's always about strategy. But Paul wanted the suffragists to be more provocative, more in your face, more in the streets, hoping that a publicity-rich strategy would help secure passage of the federal amendment. The leadership of the National American Women's Suffrage Association preferred a more conservative approach, state by state, lobbying legislators, traditional methods, petitioning, um, and they were not happy with this off the plantation strategy. So soon after the 1913 parade, the militant suffrage suffragists broke away and form, formed their own organization, which they eventually called the National Women's Party. Its sole purpose was to work on a federal amendment. The split deepened when the National Women's Party began actually endorsing candidates and trying to get them elected or defeated back in the states, um, which, you know, that Nassau would never have done. This, they um, sent organizers to nine western states trying to persuade voters to oppose Democratic candidates during the 1914 um, election. Democrats were opposed. This was another time. Democrats were opposed. Republicans were in favor. Um, after that candidate endorsement campaign, half of the de Democrats lost. And soon after, the women's suffrage amendment was reintroduced into Congress for the first time in two decades. That strategy, of course, wouldn't have worked if there had not also been a state-by-state -state strategy that was electing suffrage welcoming members to Congress. But this whole thing infuriated the National Suffrage Association. It undermined support for their strategy. The two of them could not get along. And um, over time, you know, they, the split deepened. If you were in a state, you weren't supposed to be a member of both. Um, you know, you could be this one, but you couldn't be that one. If you were that one, you couldn't be the other one. Anyway, um, eventually, uh, Rudolph Wilson did endorse the program, and he addressed the 1916 party convention um, with that endorsement. Meanwhile, Alice Paul over here with the National Women's Party on the NASA side was Carrie Chapman Catt. She was not the publicity hound. She was a brilliant organizer. She drew up detailed plans. She was like an engineer. She had a plan. She had a role for every single state, and every state was assigned a role to play. So the two of them are working each side of their aisle. At the same time, and this was the Carrie Chapman Cat side of it, the um, efforts to win state campaigns continued with New York State, the prize jewel. The 1915 referendum was coming up again. I mean, these things were up again and again and again. The most significant development in that race was that Tammany Hall sat it out. Um, you know, these Democratic machines had been a key opponent in all of these campaigns up until this point. Finally, Tammany said, you know, this could win, and we don't want those women to be mad at us, so we're just going to keep our mouths shut. And that actually proved conclusive. The measure passed with a margin of 100,000 votes in New York City. The rest of the state split. New York City was the deciding factor, and the state passed in New York. All of a sudden, a big eastern state had passed women's suffrage, and it was uh, a huge and important victory in the east. Now we're on the cusp of victory, and so before we turn the page to how we won, I want to say a word about the opposition. Um, you know, some of them were working class men who were understandably reluctant to give up some of their power. 
and especially because some of the leadership of the suffrage movement characterized these men as dirty, drunken immigrants, violent radicals. That wasn't the way to make friends and influence people. But, you know, men were part of the opposition. Um, their opposition defeated many state campaigns. Um, at the same time, many of the original anti-leaders were women of wealth and standing. The National Association opposed to women's suffrage was mostly very affluent, well-to-do conservative women. There were also the liquor interests, as I've talked about before. There were the Democratic Party machines like Tammany Hall, and there were Catholics. Um, many of the anti-suffrage leaflets remarked on Catholic clergy and directly advocated Catholic voters um, in opposition to the suffrage campaign. There were also, you know, the robber barons. Um, you know, business interests were difficult to link to this directly, but, um, you know, most of them were of an oligarchic frame of mind. They opposed the federal income tax. They thought um, the income tax was communistic. They opposed direct election of U.S. senators. They thought direct po popular democracy was a threat to their dominance economically and otherwise. Um, the addition of another large body of voters, that is, let's say women, was a threat. Um, and they believed that um, if women were allowed to vote, that they would use their power to improve working conditions for women. <laughs> you know, imagine that. Uh, there, there, there were clear and dramatic links in, between women's suffrage and the drive to make child labor illegal, which the robber barons opposed. So, in, you know, in, in fact, their fears were well-founded because once we did cross the finish line, these were exactly the issues that women voters targeted right out of the gate. But, um, you know, that was where the opposition was coming from. And then there's this which again, the elephant in the room, from the very beginning, um, Southern Democrats were the staunchest foes of the 19th Amendment, viewing it, I'm no kidding, as a threat to civilization. Even when Woodrow Wilson, a Democrat, reversed his position, he was unable to bring his party along. It had taken every bit of racist ingenuity to erect the Jim Crow barriers that defanged the 14th and 15th Amendments. By 1918, poll taxes literacy tests and the like had closed southern voting booths to African-American African men. Women's suffrage, they believed, southerners believed, would undermine that bigoted project if it spurred solidarity between women and blacks and led to enforcement of the constitutional rights for blacks. The Shafroth-Palmer Amendment, 1914, defined women's suffrage as a state's rights issue. Does that have a familiar ring to it? Um, this was, you know, a tough compromise. The NASA, our conservative foremothers, um, endorsed the, this Shafroth Palmer Amendment, believing that a federal amendment could never be ratified without the support of some southern states. They were counting votes, and they compromised. Ten states ultimately refused to ratify the 19th Amendment. They were all in the South, Delaware, Virginia, Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Florida. When the United States entered the war in 1917, neither of the two organizations, neither NASA or the National Women's Party, abandoned the suffrage struggle in, in spite of the fact that many of them had pacifist history. Um, they all urged support for both the war and suffrage agitation and believe that their patriotic efforts on behalf of the war would eventually win political support for their ultimate cause. The National Women's Party, concentrating exclusively on suffrage, continued using militant tactics and introduced propaganda um, ridiculing the claims that America could, could fight for democracy abroad while denying women the right to vote at home. Most infamously, in January 1917, they began silent picketing outside the White House, initially tolerated by Wilson, um, harassment and violence provoked by onlookers finally escalated to the point where the picketers were being arrested. Ultimately, about 218 women were arrested. You can't hear me? Is it better if I get closer? Is that good? Okay. When the United States, oh, I did that one already, sorry. Um, at, at first, the charges against these women were dismissed, the sentences were minimal, 
but penalties increased over the next few months. Some of the women began hunger strikes to protest the heavy punishment, bad conditions, and brutal treatment in prison. In response, many of you know, the women were force-fed. And finally, when the pub pub publicity broke, officials were forced to release them all. Women during the war, though, were coming forth in increasing numbers to do jobs previously held by men to sit on government bodies associated with the war effort. The last parade before ratification in New York in October 1917 had divisions of women farmers, women workers in industry, doctors, Red Cross nurses, emphasizing that the role that women were playing as equal partners in the war effort. Hopes for a quick victory in the war were shattered. Wilson, preoccupied with the war, um, was not doing anything about the amendments, so the National Women's Party resumed its more militant demonstrations, generating more arrests, more jail sentences, more publicity. It took a year and a half for the Senate to vote, and only at the instigation of hostile senators from the South who were confident that it would lose. On September 30th, Wilson took the unusual step of addressing the Senate during a debate describing enfranchisement as the only fair consideration, considering all of the contributions that women had made to the war effort. States' rights advocates remained adamantly opposed, and it lost by two votes. In February 1919, the Senate raised it once again. It was defeated by one vote. That was February. By May, six more states had granted women to write the right to vote. And in May, when Wilson called Congress into a special session, um, the measure carried in the House by a wide majority, thanks to the election of over 100 new pro-suffrage le legislators, and it passed in the Senate on June 4th by a two-vote majority. Ratification in the states was another matter. It required another long struggle. It became, um, the passage came quickly in states where suffrage organizations had been active and the process dragged on short of the required votes into 1920. Finally, only one more state was needed. Most of the holdouts were in the South. The battle came to a head in August in Tennessee while relentless lobbying by pro and anti-suffrage forces and reports of threats, bribes, drunken legislators dragged on. The Senate passed the measure easily, but in the House there were delays engineered by the opposition. It was up, it was down, it was in, it was out, and the suffragists thought they were going to lose. When the roll call finally came, a young Republican from the eastern mountains of Tennessee, Harry Burns, unexpectedly voted aye. It gives me chills to think about it. He had found a note from his mother urging him to support the measure, and it's, it, it passed. Um, the 19th Amendment squeaked into the U.S. Constitution on that day, August 26, 1920. 500 separate campaigns, millions of volunteers, over 70 years of struggle. In the big cities, when the news reached the telegraph stations, women flooded into the street in euphoric joy. It was huge. The League of Women Voters, founded by Cherry Chapman, Carrie Chapman Catt in 1920, during the convention of their organization right before that, so the League was born just on the cusp of the passage of the 19th Amendment. It began as a mighty political experiment designed to help 20 million women carry out their new responsibilities as voters, it urged them to use their new power to participate actively in public policy. From the beginning, the League has been an activist, grassroots organization whose leaders believe that citizens should play an active role in advocacy. I put this slide up, I don't know if you can read it, but it shows their first plank, what the issues were they were working on. You can see child welfare, education, home and high prices, women in gainful occupation. So all of the opposition's fears about what women were gonna get up to when they got the vote were fully realized like day one. <laughs> um, meanwhile, and I'm gonna talk about it in a minute, the National Women's Party was off on a different 
angle. They really wanted the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment. You know, the right to vote was one thing, but full equal rights was the other thing, and the National Women's Party immediately turned um, to that campaign. But now, the splits and divisions. You know, there, it was not all sunshine and roses from the beginning or even at the end, and let's just talk about racism for a minute. The fact that the movement had, oh, go back, go back. The fact that the movement had its roots in anti-slavery did not mean white suffragists believed in racial equity. They did not. The rift began with the passage of the 15th Amendment. Mrs. Stanton made derogatory references to Sambo, the enfranch enfranchisement of ignorant foreigners. She talked about how white women would be degraded if black men got the vote. Language like this cannot be interpreted in any other way except as racist. She and um, S Susan B. Anthony, Matilda Gage, and others wrote the book. I mean, this is the book, The History of Women's Suffrage. It was, you know, she who writes the history owns the story or something like that. But the significance of black women in the movement was completely overlooked in this seminal history. And resuscitating those stories has been the work of modern historians. It continues to be excavated even now. There are too many of them to talk about, but here's Mary Church Terrell that I talked about earlier, the first woman granted a college education, Marianne Shad Carey, Coralie Franklin Cook, Mary W. Stewart, um, the Fortin sisters, Harriet Fortin Purvis, Sarah Parker Redmond, Charlotte Fortin Grimke, Frances Harper, Margareta Fortin, these Fortin sisters were a force to be reckoned with. You know, their stories, um, are only now really being fully told. They were excluded. National Women's Suffrage Association, the dominant white organization, held conventions that excluded black women. The exclusion of black women from those clubs led them to organize their own clubs and to recognize the need for their own national organization. But in the 20th century, NASA discouraged those clubs from trying to affiliate with the national organization. Alice Paul, on the other side, refused to let the celebrated newspaper editor Ida B. Wells march in the white delegation at the 1913 parade. Stung and in tears, Wells slipped into the Illinois delegation anyway and marched with them despite being asked not to. Sold out. By the 1920s, many white suffragists had come to believe that focusing on white women voting was the only way to get the 19th Amendment through Congress. They knew they needed one or two southern states to join them. Carrie Chapman Catt openly acknowledged that black women in the South would likely be disenfranchised in precisely the same way that black men had, but doing a horrible and practical calculation. She noted that in southern states, on the whole, white women outnumbered black women. So, quote, if the South really wants white supremacy, it will urge enfranchisement of women. This is tough stuff. Th these statements are outrageous to modern ears, but the ba backers of women's suffrage were counting the votes. You know, they were making a practical calculation, a half a loaf, a whole loaf, a half a loaf, a whole loaf, what do I have to say to get a half a loaf? It's tragic. The passage of the 19th Amendment led to a doubling down on Jim Crow in the South. It got worse after um, the 19th Amendment passed for African Americans and white women were no help. Support for literacy tests survived for decades out of fears that undereducated working people and immigrants would vote redress would have to wait many, many years and continues to be the work of our generation today. Clash of the Titans, Carrie Chapman Cat on the left, Alice Paul on the right, street fighter or under the dome, radical or polite, state campaigns or federal, endorsing candidates or opposing candidates. I mean, those of us who do reform work today recognize these tensions, they live on, these things are still the struggles that we deal with in working in coalitions, but it was a huge rift between the two organizations. Like I said, if you were in Maine, you were really not supposed to be a member of both. They didn't want their brand 
diluted with members from the other side. After the 19th Amendment passed, the National Women's Party went on to support the ERA. Um, and it was introduced by Alice Paul in 1923. I think it was pretty much the same language as the ones that um, was still not yet passed, but surfacing. It was not universally embraced by all the suffrage sisters. Many, including the League of Women Voters, believed that important labor protections that had been hard won for working women would be lost if the amendment passed. In fact, the League did not endorse the ERA until 1972. These tensions lived on for a long time, right? So who got left behind? Okay, this is a long and shocking list. African Americans, Mexican Americans, Franco Americans, Asian Americans, Indian Americans, you get the picture. If you were a woman on that list, you still couldn't vote, right? People weren't talking about LGBTQ in those days, but, um, and over the, the passing years, some of these barriers have come down, not all, but some. In 1965, the passage of the Landmark Voting Rights Act um, eliminated poll tax and liter literacy tests. In Maine, we had literacy tests on our um, books until 1979. After the Voting Rights Act passed, there was a measure to eliminate Maine's um, literacy test. It went on the ballot in 1979 and lost by two to one. It was a measure that was targeting Frank, French speakers, Franco-Americans, um, and it lost. It was only stricken from our Constitution by judicial review because of the, the Voting Rights Act and the, the Reconstruction Amendments. Native Americans weren't guaranteed the right to vote until um, 1962. The Chinese Exclusion Act, then the Penn Walters Act, um, Asian Americans, including women were grant the right, granted the right to vote as naturalized citizens much later. Um, prisoner and felon disenfranchisement was explicitly permitted by the 13th Amendment. Many, many states, including New York, enacted these felon, and voting, felon disenfranchisement measures in order to disenfranchised black voters. They were arrested, not because of what they did, but in order to prevent them from voting. These barriers are only now beginning to fall. Other barriers remain. Women didn't get everything either. In terms of leadership, studies done by organizational psychologists show that when you're asked to draw a picture of an effective leader, both men and women almost always draw a man. And these unconscious assumptions about who's a leader makes it very difficult for people's emerging leadership to be recognized. Getting noticed as a leader in the workplace or in politics is just much more difficult for women than it is for men. Women have made some pretty great strides. They've been elected to state legislatures and to Congress and have held high administrative posts. Two women, Geraldine Ferraro, Sarah Palin, have won the vice presidential nominations of the major party. One woman secured the presidential nomination of a major party. We have the first female speaker of the house. We have the first state legislature to be majority women. That's Nevada as of 2018. Um, today, a record of 127 women serve in the two houses of Congress. That is by far short of the majority that they deserve. Women are still underrepresented in Congress and we have not yet elected a woman as president. At the same time, there are still significant re voting restrictions in many states. Overall, 25 states have put in place new restrictions since 2010. More restrictive photo ID laws, um, closing um, early voting polls, made it harder for citizens to register, um, made it harder to restore voting rights for people with past criminal convictions, and then, of course, the, the seminal rollback of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act in 2013. If, you know, these fights are not yet over. So there's still plenty of work to do. The debate about the intersectional, about how intersectional feminism should be continues on, the legacy of this long struggle. Building trust among each other is really hard. Fighting for universal equity, for political suffrage, not, let me do this over, 
fighting for political equity, universally applied, may be a never-ending struggle. It may be the nature of human beings that we have to fight for this for as long as human beings roam the earth. The arc of the moral universe, as they say, bends toward justice. Don't you believe it? It must be bent. And it will take all of our strength to do it. Welcome to the fight. I'm happy to take a few questions. Um, if you, I, we have Jessica here. We'll hand the mic around. If you, there's one there. There, well, the, the, the federal amendment is in a tough place right now. We do not have a favorable Congress, as you may well imagine. Um, there is a, an equal rights amendment that is circulating for passage in the main state legislature. It has passed the Senate. Um, it is short just a few votes in the House, and there is a strong effort afoot to recruit a few Republicans to sign on to get two-thirds um, for a main state amendment. Um, those efforts are continuing. There's a lot of debate about how you count, how many have ratified, how many have rescinded at the federal level, but um, those efforts are ongoing, absolutely. Anybody else? Uh, explain a little bit more of like Portland or Maine's like uh, contribution to the suffragette movement? I am not an expert on Maine history. Um, you know, Maine had both a uh, Nassau and a National Women's Party chapter. There was a famous, um, wh who is Ann Gass's mother, Lucy Whitehouse? Florence Whitehouse Brooks was instrumental in forming a unity group in Maine that worked for um, suffrage so that members of both groups could participate. Um, Maine passed or Maine ratified the, um, the 19th Amendment on November 5th, uh, the year before, so that would be 1919. We'll celebrate the day Maine ratified the amendment on Election Day this year, so that's kind of big. Um, but I'm not an expert at, in the Maine effort. Um, there's a great exhibit going on right now at the Maine Historical Society that excavates some of what actually happened in Maine and who were some of the local stories that were instrumental in working for it here. I would recommend that. And I, I wanted to say that one of the things that struck me is how much of this got lost between 1920 and 1972 and then afterwards. And I think part of the importance of this kind of a meeting is just to remind people and the younger generation how this happened and that the struggles and the messiness that we see today is not new, that it's just part of the, part of the thing. What I would like to rem remind people is that I went to Russell Sage College in Troy, New York which was, grew out of Troy Female Seminary, which is where Elizabeth Cady Stanton uh -huh. was educated. And I was there for four years in the 60s, and never once did I ever hear mention of her name. Seriously, that's so interesting. So I think it's important for us not to let the story die and to keep the struggle going. Well, and for those of us who are working on some tough issues, whether it's the ERA or campaign finance reform or voting rights, when you think about the monumental nature and the multi-generational nature of this struggle and how if they hadn't been ready with so much on the ground, 
when World War I hit, they would never have done it. You know, it took years of work and then a moment in history and it passed. And so for those of us working on these other issues, we have to be ready when our moment in history comes. It's so important that we continue doing that work. Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate it.